everybody, welcome back to part two of this professionally incorrect series on doing a vellum ball cube morph thing. Uh, I'm going to link below to part one. If you missed that for whatever reason, you accidentally clicked into here. And then parts two and three, four, however many parts there are to this. I'm not really sure at the moment as I'm recording it. Uh, they'll be down below as well. So since uh, we last were in here, I did a couple things, uh, just some prep, and I forgot to hit record. <laughs> so uh, just to update you, I threw down this null called out, colored it green by hitting C on the keyboard, and you can pick your color, and typing in all caps. Uh, the reason why it's all caps is because Houdini prioritizes that over lowercase letters. So when we go to select this as we're moving into our vellum simulation, it'll be right there at the top, easy for selecting. And I've grouped these two. Uh, so what groups are like polygon selections inside Cinema 4D? And I've set these selections over here as our hatch, like so. And you may not have this up here under group name, this dollar $OS. That's just saying get the object string here or operator string here. And mine is hatch. So if I middle click on this, you'll see. Okay, we've got all of our prims or polygon selection, as I was saying. Uh, called hatch there, and then I've done that over here for array as well. So that way, as we're moving forward, keep those separated until we need them back together again. And let's pop back up here. There we go. And I've already set this geometry node here uh, and renamed these a bit. So the part one, initial animation, just so we know what's going on in there. It's not just part one. And then in here, part two, vellum setup, because Guess what? We're doing vellum in there. <laughs> so my weight com is being weird. There we go. And finally let me in. Let's start uh, bringing in our stuff from the other one. So the way we're going to do that is by hitting tab and doing object merge. And this lets us bring in other objects into other objects and merge them together. Aptly named, right? <laughs> so click on this here and scroll on up to the top and you'll see Hey, there's our out animation right at the top there. You'll see our out template as well from the template points that we made, but we can just click on this and we'll bring this in. And you'll see we've got our group area here. We can come in and just select array like so. And now we've only brought in that and that's fully in here now. Now, I'm a huge fan of cheating inside 3D and doing less work than I need to do. We certainly could try and have this full animation turn into vellum and all of that in one fell swoop, but it would be a pain in the butt. So my thought process is let's just disconnect the two and we can do a cool little sleight of hand once we get to here of boop, it'll be vellum. So we'll watch this animation and then transitions and then we're gonna switch it to vellum without the viewer actually knowing. So there's a few things I want to go through first with this. First one being is just like getting rid of stuff that could interact with vellum. And the way we're going to do that is through a clean sop. What this clean sop does is deletes any like erroneous weird points and uh, attributes and groups and things that we just don't need, like data that could get corrupted along the line. So let's see. I think everything is good here. We want to check these two boxes though. So what this is doing is saying remove attributes. The star means all of them and remove groups. Star means all groups. And you probably saw that our viewport changed because we no longer have normals or our UVs. We'll bring those back in just a second. But just to show you what's happening, if you middle click here, we now only have our position data, while before we had mask, position, our array, group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let's bring in our normals and keep them and our UV as well. And the way we can do that is by doing hat or caret, which is uh, number six on a US style keyboard, and M for normal, that's our normal attribute. And hat again, and UV for, you guessed it, UV attribute. And there we go. We've got our UVs and normals back. And we can see that by clicking that there for our normals. So I think I may have screwed up in the last video with where I put the UVs. Let's 
fix that really quickly. Because I put the UVs. Where did I put the UVs? Hmm. Did I only do it on the tube? I did. I only did it on the tube. I thought I had messed something up over here, so we'll do the auto UV right there. And we'll grab some normals again by alt-dragging, like so. Cool. Now this will be correct. And if I look at that, there we go. UV map, like so. And correct normals again, like so. All right, let's go back over to our vellum setup. And now we are truly <laughs> ready to go with our normals and UVs and everything cleared out. All right, we're going to do this sleight of hand thing by saying, hey Houdini, pause any more information about this animation. We, we just wanna freeze time and get this last bit here after the transition. So the way we can do that is by throwing down a time shift and piping that in there. And time shift is really cool. You can manually do stuff with time, like sort of like After Effects and time remapping in there. So let's say I wanted frame one there, when I'm frame 24, I want it to be at frame 72 already. So it just speeds it up to 72 and I didn't set any keyframes like a dum dum. So Alt click and 72 like so, Alt click. And now you'll see super fast boop, like that. So cool way to do some manual time remapping type things. What we're gonna do is clear this out clear out all the H script that's in there. And we want frame 72, because that's when our animation ends, like so. So that would just freeze us here. As we move down the line, if you notice that you have any issues with anything, this clamp here will let you say, hey, make sure that on every frame, the start frame is exactly this, and the end frame is exactly this. Sometimes you have to clear this out and set this to 72 and 72, whatever your frame is up here. Um, it seems to be hit or miss for me sometimes. I, I can't quite nail exactly when I need this. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and for good measure, clamp this to both 72 and 72. So we know this is gonna be for sure frame 72 the whole time, just not to mess around with it. Um, we can go ahead and just call this freeze. And I'm actually gonna call this in, uh, array animation so we know that's what's going on and we'll color it green like so good to go all right so we've gotten our moment frozen in time we've cleaned our geometry now let's see if this is even gonna work i'm gonna use a simple setup called vellum balloon just really easy configuration to work with you don't have to really think about most of the settings in here we're just gonna use this to get started and then we'll start to make adjustments as we go through. So we need our solver to see anything like this and boom. And let's do a little calculation, cool. So what's happening here is we've got two different types of constraints. This one sets our initial cloth. So if I were to turn this off here and hit play, this will just kind of flop down like so. You can't really see anything. So I'm gonna turn on this ground plane right here. And you'll see in a second when it hits the ground, it just will collapse like cloth, like so. So cool, if that's what you want. Uh, I'm gonna turn these constraint iterations down because we really don't need that. And, oh, you know what? I forgot to do something, everybody. Vellum really likes triangles a lot better. And we didn't convert these to triangles yet. Uh, you can just leave them as quads, but I like to throw down a remesh. Go like that. And that's obviously not going to be a good sleight of hand trick. That doesn't look like a sphere. So if we come down to say 0.1, take a look, we're getting closer. Set our target size over here to say 0.05. Getting a little bit closer. I think 0.25 is gonna be the sweet spot there. So let's see, that's that one, that, uh, I think maybe 0.2 even, just, hmm, 
Let's try one one five. I'm just worried that as we switch it over, it, it won't be. Yeah, that'll be good. Okay, point point one five. Um, the reason I'm doing that is, as we do our sleight of hand, we want to make sure that it looks like we have not switched to these spheres here. Um, so we just have to keep them as smooth as possible. All right. Now when we run vellum, so, see it's a good bit faster as well. Like yes, we, we did lower our constraint iterations, but uh, it shouldn't be that much faster just from that. So cool. All right, now if I turn on this pressure one and hit play, ah, oh, sorry, my everything screenshot keeps popping up. Uh, this is a little bit more rubbery, doesn't just quite fall to the bottom, and you can see some of these still have a little bit of pressure or like air inside. So that's what the pressure does. It treats it as if there is pressure inside of our objects there. And we can increase this to like a thousand or so, sorry, a million. So we get six million and change our rest length to like five and we should watch these poof up like, like that. You'll know, see we get all these kind of blobby, bubbly things falling down. So cool. Um, yeah, we've kind of jumped ahead <laughs> now from where I was expecting to go uh, with my notes, but that's fine. So we know that we want to stop the vellum constraint or stop the vellum simulation from happening until we trigger it. We know that we want these to blow up and not really blow up, but inflate when we want. Maybe have some control over those and we want them to fly off. So I think the fastest, easiest thing to do first is to let's set up our wind and our upward motion for these. There is wind built in to vellum. I find it doesn't work the way that I expected to, the way it works with like pop wind inside of the actual solver, where if I set this to five, or I'll even do, I'll just do like two, there's like nothing really happens. And if I go five, you might get like just a little bit of push there. But if we go inside, clear this out, turn off the wind here, and we throw down a pop wind inside of our solver, hook this up, and put our velocity to five, and our amplitude, three might be too much, but to two to get some noise in there, you'll see these really start to take off. Um, and I don't know if that's a difference because this is velocity, maybe this, if I can go up, is a force. Let me see if it says wind direction. Since this is a drag force, a wind of zero will act like there's still air and slow everything down. Huh. Maybe that's it because it's acting like a force. Um, not sure. It just, just never seems to overpower gravity. The way this does and i like leaving gravity on because then it actually influences stuff as you can see right here like there's just a little bit of drag and takes a little bit for this one to take off um yeah interesting so anywho we've got our wind set up we've got some poofiness let's stop these from moving so this is probably the easiest attribute to remember besides a few other handful ones that make sense like n for normal uh or uv stopped. So if you want to stop these, we can create an attribute create like so. Plug this in here and say stopped. Oop, not stooped. Stopped. And we were talking about this before in the last video. Stopped is an integer attribute because it's kind of like a boolean on off operation if you know anything about those where zero means off and one means activate and this actually has a two three and maybe even a four uh value that you can use but zero means hey stopped isn't actually activated so let these play through one 
means stop everything. Don't do anything. Kill believe is, hey, don't move, but allow rotation. And three and four are kind of like variations of other things. Uh, so read the Houdini docs. I almost never use anything outside of zero and one. I've, I've never found a need to just have something stopped and rotating around in space. Usually I want everything to be stopped. All right, so let's check this out. It should just work by everything being stopped. Cool, good to go. All right, so how do we activate this? Well, we can use a mask again, and I was thinking about making a new one, but let's cheat again and go get our other one from over here. So here's our mask from target before, which should basically be in the spot that we want. And we're gonna pipe it in over here. And I'm just gonna call this activate, but it's still gonna be our mask. And I must have missed that before. We don't need 1.4 radius. And let's see. Oh, I'm not on that. Forgot to flag this here. Cool. So this is going through right there. It's not showing up. Cool. So if you ever hit this button over here and you don't get any colors in your viewport, make sure this is turned on here. And if it is turned on and nothing's showing up, right click on it and you can manually select your visualization there. So we've got that going like so. I think we want to activate it maybe around frame five there. So middle click on the keyframe, slide that back. Middle click here and we can do, I don't know, 36. That sounds good to me. Cool, all right. So that's good there. And we're gonna throw down another null. And then in caps, we'll do out. And yeah, we'll do activate here as well. I'm just gonna color this red so we know that that's an important node. And let's go into our solver. And there are multiple ways to do what we're about to do. You can use all vex. Mops has a cool fetch option inside Mops Plus to get attributes from the SOP level. I have found the easiest way, mostly because it's through visualization, is to use a SOP solver. And what that is going to do is basically bring everything that's at our SOP level into DOPS for us to have access to. That's a very crude way of thinking about it, but um, if I type tab here, you'll see that we get everything that we get in SOPS, but if I come back out to our forces here, we don't get all of those options. Um, so what that means is we can use our object merge again to bring in our, oh, still down in solver, that's still untwirled, there we go. Bring in our active right there. I'm gonna say in activate, or not active, activate, misspoke there. And now we are bringing in everything that's happening at the top level into our solver so it knows to read the data that's happening at that level and use it here. We can't just pipe it in here because the SOP solver doesn't know to keep looking at the chain of events that's happening up here. So we have to somehow bring this in to SOPs, or sorry, into DOPS or Vellum. So it knows every frame reference what's happening at that level. So we're, we're merging that in here and we wanna transfer our mask data transfer over to the geometry stream that's happening in DOPS. So this is everything that's happening in DOPS and we can manipulate that by transferring our mask like so. And again, there are short vellum ways, or not vellum, <laughs> vex ways to do this, but I like the visualization of this next node of the attribute composite sorry, attribute combine, which you're actually kind of compositing attributes together. So that's why I slipped up there. So the attribute combine, like so, lets you combine attributes together in a quasi Photoshop layer manipulation way where you've got copy, add, subtract, multiply, etc. 
And what we want to do is set our destination of stopped here and use our mask against that. So here's our mask. Make sure you choose mask because there's also mass and I've made the mistake of, of grabbing mass before. So make sure you grab mask. And we want to multiply it against that. And the reason we want to multiply and not add is uh, you're basically taking the one here and multiplying against zero or one. So one times zero would mean, okay, this is now zero, activate, no longer be stopped. And multiplying one against it means stay at that current one value. All right, back at the top level here, we're gonna hit play, cross our fingers. See that turned red, don't really need that. And we're off, cool. I'm gonna just turn off that visualization. So we're like 99% of the way there. You, you could do this. This could be what you want and you're fine with this. Uh, in the video I did, I had these be a little bit randomized and uh, had a little bit more control over it. But you're essentially set up with vellum there, and those fly off like so. Let's let's make these a little bit better, though. Let's control our pressure and let's take a look at what's happening right here. You can see like this kind of looks cool. Look at this initial like brop up there, but I want to activate the whole thing at once. So what's happening? is if I turn this visualization back on, as soon as these points, which are slightly turning red now, and I hope that's coming across in the recording, get activated, all of these points up here are activated, but not down here. And then it slides through and these start to become more and more activated, like so. However, I want them to activate at once, not just bloop, but like the whole thing bubble out. So the way we can do that is by packing these. And what packing does is takes geometry and basically converts them into just point data. So if we middle click on this here, we've got 16,000 points, almost 17,000 points for rounding up. Click on this here and it goes to one, which actually is not what we want to do. That is wrong. I should have used an assemble. And the reason why I want to use an assembled is it will actually look at these individually and uh, make each one of these a packed primitive instead of a single unit pack primitive. So um, same idea, but as each individual one. So we do that. Now we middle click and we have 54 points. And over here we have 16,000, almost 17,000. Same with primitives, down to 54, 54, 54. You can see it says packed fragments down there. So what that means is instead of, I'm just gonna throw down an add. Instead of this running across here and activating the whole mesh, it's running across and it's just a single point that's getting activated. And that single point means, okay, as it does anything but stopped. So as soon as we get some information there, the whole thing will poof up. And if I did this right, fingers crossed, here we go again, this should poof up. Now you can see the difference. So even though it's visually going across these points at a different period, because we have that single point inside now for this packed information, it's now activating across the entire geometry that's right there. So show the difference here, turn off the assemble. Again, we get these bloops up here, which is kind of cool looking, or we can activate them all at once by using an assemble and packing them and just putting the data on an individual point for it to pull into. Cool. Um, I think that's looking good. I'm gonna turn down our rest length that we're using at the moment, turn this off here, 
and hop inside the solver to start randomizing this. All right, so inside the solver, we are going to use a little bit of X. It won't be much, I promise it'll, it'll be okay. And start activating our pressure over time so we can get some randomization and uh, variation in the triggering. So Vellum has this cool Vellum constraints property, which will let you manipulate the properties at this level here over time. Uh, one thing we want to do though is we want to output a group of our constraints just for the pressure here. So right now it's called stretch. I'm going to call it P stretch because if we look at our cloth up here, this one is also called stretch and we don't want that. We just want to be controlling the rest length of our pressure right there. Go ahead and activate this. You'll see we have P stretch in there and stretch individualized. And there's even a bend one too, but we'll just worry about this. To make sure this is working, I'm gonna click this brain to turn off our simulations for a second and keyframe this from there to say here, even though we don't need it that far. I'll just show that as these are flying up, they get bigger and bigger over time. So I'm gonna pull the camera back, turn the brain back on and let this run. So initially they're kind of flat and then as they go up, they should get bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. I should not have made these keyframes so far apart. I swear they're getting bigger. You just can't really tell because floating up. Let's move this back down to like 48. There you go. You can see that those indents from before are gone and then this is going up and nice and blobby like. So kind of floppy at first down here and then poofs back up and gets that stretch back. So that's working as we want and clear that out by control shift clicking on that. And now we're going to bring in our activate here, but for our constraints. So there's a couple things that we need to do. One, we need to tell Vellum to look at that as an input here. And we can select many different ways of bringing it in. I'm just gonna directly do the SOP here, come back out like we did before, go to our out activate, hit accept. So now we can type some VEX down here and pull in that data. So what we're gonna do is, even though we have this attribute mask, we're gonna simplify things by declaring a, another mask that we can work with. And by doing that, we just make our life a little bit easier with coding. So we're gonna say float mask, because our mask is a float, it goes from zero to one with points in between, equals, and we're gonna type out point, and that's because we're gonna get the point information from this SOP that we just brought in. That point information is our mask. So if we go look at our inputs, the way it works in Houdini is each input is one number off because we're dealing with computer notation here. So input one is actually zero, two, one, three, two, so on and so forth. So we're gonna be looking at not one, two, but our third input, which is actually two. And then our mask attribute. So we're saying, hey, get this mask attribute. And that's it. We don't need to worry about the last parameter. And the reason I'm, we're doing this is just so we don't have to type this every time. Uh, this would be a pain to type every time instead of like at mask like we normally can do. So we're just setting that as mask. Now we can use mask wherever we want. So let's see if we can get something going here. If we take a look at our parameters up here, you can see that we've got rest scale right there. So we can type rest scale down here equals, and actually we'll do times equals because that means take the current rest length scale and multiply it against whatever values we put over here, which is the same as uh, rest scale equals rest scale times mask. Instead of having to type rest scale twice, do star equals 
of that mask. Let's see if we get anything. Hit play. And not really. Let's boost this up to five to see. Okay, so there we go. As the mask comes through, up, oh, but look, it deflates. So it starts with that, but because of the way the mask comes in, where this is all one and it's going down to zero, you can see, oh, we get this poof, and then they go flat. So we need to remap this mask somehow. We want to make sure that we're not scaling down afterwards, but we're either scaling up or keeping it the same or even randomizing it. So the way we can do that is, let me get that out of there, we can do a fit 01. And what this says is take this mask and it's already at a normalized zero to one range. So this 01 range and remap it to something. And we can remap it to say one and two. So it'll start with really big and then it will go back down to five. So we're gonna see this balloon up to two times this amount because it's two times five and it's gonna scale back down to one. Why did that not reset properly? There we go. So now we get these really big bubbles. And we can do it the other way too. Instead of one to two, we can do two to one. So now zero is equal to two and one, or it's, yeah, one is equal to one. It's gonna stay the same. So it'll start, stay the same, and then as it comes through, it's gonna get even bigger. You can see these really puffing up there. Okay, cool, so we're getting somewhere. Let's take a look at how we could randomize these a little bit. So it's a little bit strange. Uh, we've been talking about dealing with points and everything, but we are working on constraints at the moment. So we look at this bindings, it's our constraint geometry. And as I said before, this is our pressure constraint in here. And those are primitives. So we can pull in point information and use it against primitives. That seems to work okay. But for number purposes, we actually need to get the number of each of these primitives if we're gonna do some randomization. And that's pretty straightforward. It's kind of like the point vex script that we wrote here. But we're gonna do uh, an integer with int and we'll just call it pt. Actually, maybe we should just call it prim equals. And we're going to use our prim point to pull in the point numbers. Um, or sorry, to convert them into point numbers. So you can see converts a primitive or vertex pair into a point number. So. I guess this will actually be better as PT. And we want this one here, and we're gonna do our prim num, which means get the prim number for each of these over here, and that's it, that's all we need. Cool. So now we can take this and multiply it against a random number. And that number will be our point there. So if we play through, each of these will be random. All right, that's looking pretty cool, except, man, that sucks that they go flat, huh? So let's see if we can manipulate this a little bit. I'm gonna take this back like so. And let's do our inflation size that we want as the random number. So it's either this one here that we've already got or a random number over there. So what we'll do is 
do uh, int and inflation equals, I'll do random and our point number. So we've got that. And then we're going to refit this point number just like we did before with another fit. So we'll do fit a one. And we want to say, okay, take this randomness and let's make it between a minimum value of 1.5 and 4. Actually, yeah, 4 and 1.5. We might have to reverse that. We'll play with it in a second. And we can come down here and type in inflation, like so. And we'll pull in this information there. Why am I getting an error? Inflation. OK. Oh, did I forget? No. OK, fit01 rand pt. That's right. That's right. Is this not supposed to be? Let me see. Maybe that's not supposed to be. Ah, it's not supposed to be an integer. Should be a float. My bad. OK. Cool. So we'll take that, hit play. And there we go. We're getting randomness throughout. So if you take a look, we've got these smaller guys there, and these bigger ones here, and so on and so forth. So. There we are. Um, just out of curiosity, if I switch these around, what are we gonna get? We're gonna get like some craziness. Uh, we pretty much get the same effect. Cool. All right, that works for me. So let's come on back here and a look at what happens when we ghost this. Oh, nope. I don't want to ghost that. Uh, do, 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 do. We'll just come up to the top level here. So this plays out like so, and then this one will trigger on like so, and that will be out of frame by the time that closes. Cool. All right. Now let's talk about retiming this a little bit. So this disappears and we get our vellum animation. Um, so first we're going to cache this. Go back into your vellum setup, do a file, cache, like so. Put this down here and I'm going to do uh, vellum, vellum balloons. And everything should be fine. I'm going to up the subsets to three and three in here, uh, just so we can make sure we get a little bit better motion blur too as we render this out. So I'm going to fast forward through this part of the video. Cool. That is cached. And I'm just going to hit play to make sure. Boop. All right. So what can we do with this? So. What we're going to do is go back out to our top level, go into our animation, and throw down a switch. And what a switch does is it lets you switch between inputs. I'm going to put another null over here, and this will be called blank. So what will happen is, as we have this on, it's on zero. That means use this first input. If it goes to one, nothing's there. For our purposes, we want it to stop showing these cubes over here at frame 72 when we switch to the vellum simulation. So what we're going to do is actually put this up here like so and at frame 73 these will go off. So the way we can do that is by saying at frame greater than frame 72 equals 1. So oop, like so. So this comes up, closes, 
and then we hit frame 72 and that comes on. And then we're going to do something similar over here where actually let me steal this from here, come into our vellum setup, put that down and pipe that in like so and we'll do a time shift again and this time we want to start our simulate or start this playback at frame 72 so we've got this dollar f in there we can clear that out it's the same as at frame i just like using at frame better and we'll say at frame plus 72 so it starts fr 72 frames later when this triggers so right now nothing and you'll see right there it goes why am i getting an error okay let's see cool do i want minus 72. oh me being a dumb dumb didn't clamp okay sorry about that so you got to make sure these are clamped to what you want your start and end frames to be so that way when it switches over it knows still being dumb yeah you want minus 72 so it's delayed 72 frames and then that kicks on there now when we're at the top level, like so, ta-da, and then we can just go in and retime the animation a bit in here with our switch to switch back on. Um, I think. may even be able to pull this in a little bit sooner at like frame 70. So let's do that here. We'll do frame 70 equals one. And I'll come back in here. And we could even just link these up too. Um, so yeah, the way we'll do that is hit right click, copy parameter, film setup, I'll come in here, paste relative reference. So that way, whatever is happening over in the other one will happen here. And then this is only minus 70. And let's see, 84. Maybe we'll do 60 frames instead. So that way, as soon as it switches starts to go that way we get a little bit more time to work with before this loop starts we might have to adjust how long the loop holds that's okay cool all right in the next video we will retime what's going on here at the beginning as we get ready for rendering we'll throw down a psych wall and we'll just tighten up anything that we need to tighten up thanks everybody and i'll see you on part three